Well, it's so nice to be here. I was hoping to make it for the full week, but um, <laughs> things just kept coming up at my day job, And but I'm, I'm thrilled to be here now. So today we're, we're going to talk about, um, in more detail, an, op an item that was touched on in the last lecture, and that is the claim that the fossil evidence supports uh, evolution theory when it comes to modern man, that special creation was not true, but that we've we evolved from ape-like creatures over a period of millions of years. Now, when I know Brad spoke earlier this week and gave two talks on the theological evidence and case for believing as Catholics in special creation, there is an extremely strong case, many would say a conclusive case, that that is part of the deposit of faith. But if you haven't studied this issue a lot on your own, you may have some some confusion in your mind thinking that, well, the fossil evidence supports human evolution, so how do I resolve this conflict? Also, many uh, Catholics, uh, in, in, even in the clergy, believe that uh, human evolution is possible and is supported by the evidence, so there's little doubt why some confusion remains in the mind of many Catholics and, and uh, other Christians as well. Well, in the next hour, we're going to show that the fossil evidence, in fact, does not support claims for human evolution. Um, this is a, a, a very important issue, and you may wonder, well, how, how on earth did even uh, many Catholic clergy get confused on this issue? The short answer is that many Catholics have fallen prey, they've been deceived by what I call the Cartesian-Darwinian narrative. And the next two talks after, that I give after this talk will go into details of that narrative. Basically, the narrative, the Cartesian-Darwinian narrative is a, an attack on truth. It is a deception that has influenced virtually every domain of thought and now dominates the world and increasingly the United States. So it's very important that we understand the false claims behind the narrative and then understand when we look out in society uh, to see what the impacts of the narrative are and why it's so essential to restore truth. Now, just to give you an idea of, of, of the background and the importance of this, this assault on truth I call the narrative, I want to, if you will, let me read just the uh, half-page conclusion from one of the later chapters in uh, our recent book, The Fall of Darwin's Last Icon. This book was published in 20, uh, January of 2020, so this is before COVID, before the rioting in the streets, the destruction of our beautiful statues, and the burning of, of churches. But it was all that we've seen in the meantime was very predictable and expected once you understand what the narrative is all about. So let me just read uh, some closing paragraphs from chapter 10 of the book. Christians cannot allow millions of students to be indoctrinated into humanistic beliefs and expect to see the faith preserved. We cannot, decade after decade, be ignorant about the tactics of educational indoctrination, fail to inform the youth about the onslaught, and somehow expect the youth to emerge unscathed. Eventually, there will come a tipping point when a large majority of indoctrinated youth no longer believe that Christianity is true, or, with, or they will reject the faith because the path of purity appears too demanding. When indoctrination occurs on a massive scale for generations, those who abandon the Christian faith will eventually rise to power in academia and the government. Once in power, they will seek to change social norms and the law. Areas especially targeted will be those related to the Epicurean search for pleasure and the silencing of opposition. This means that on the political front, laws will be targeted to promote or allow abortion, cloning, euthanasia, cohabitation, the redefinition of marriage, and the suppression of opposing religious expression. Those in the complicit media will provide support by engaging in massive propaganda and distortions in order to manipulate the population and demonize the opposition. 
It is also to be expected that agitators will organize to create massive social unrest and intimidate the opposition, for this was called for by Marx. Such conflict is seen as a necessary evil. It is a survival of the fittest being played out in the public square. From the conflict, a new and better society will emerge. All this is part of the humanist socialist program that is now the face of the narrative. The conflicts now observed in America do not result simply from liberal versus conservative politics. We are witnessing the war of worldviews being played out in the public square of politics, in the media, and in the culture at large. Current events leave, me, leave many Christians and patriots bewildered as to what is happening, and many do not see the inevitable replacement of capitalism and the marginalization of Christianity because many do not perceive the educational system as completely committed to implement the entire humanist socialist agenda. Still less do they perceive that parents are funding the destruction and that behind it all is the Cartesian Darwinian narrative. Nevertheless, this much is clear. Unless the education system is soon liberated from the narrative, in particular from humanist educators who most of all rely on Darwinism for the intellectual, intellectual justification, the indoctrination will continue and the nation will increasingly reflect narrative-based philosophies. If the indoctrination results in behaviors harmful to the mental, physical, and spiritual well-being of millions of students, if it means that the nation falls into chaos, if it results in a climate of intolerance towards Christians, and if it causes economic downfall, well, no war is without its casualties. So the stakes in understanding the false claims of the narrative, which are very, very heavily dependent upon claims for human evolution, uh, the stakes are very high that we understand how to explain to others that are seeking the truth why the narrative and claims of human evolution, in fact, are not true. All right, so let's dive in. It'll take us about an hour to go through and show why the uh, the traditional drawings here of human evolution do not uh, do not hold water. Of course, you would not know that if you listen to claims of the National Academy of Sciences, who says in teaching about evolution, it is no longer possible to sustain scientifically the view that the human species was not produced by the same evolutionary mechanisms that apply to the rest of the living world. Also from uh, Kenneth Miller, a self-professed Catholic in Finding Darwin's God, he writes, for all the fuss and concern that surround the idea of human evolution, the detailed fossil evidence of our ancestry is remarkably powerful. All right, so in the, the remainder of my talk, we're going to dive into the scientific literature and see what it has to say about the so-called hominids from an ape-like creature to modern man. I handed out a, uh, a chart, chart there earlier uh, before my talk that you can follow along, but um, let me just explain the organization here. On the bottom or the middle of, of your chart will be a timeline that starts uh, from the present time, zero, and then goes back in times in millions of years. So MYA, MYA stands for millions of years ago. And above the timeline, you can see, and, and by the way, these are all evolutionist dates. Uh, I, don't, I don't accept these, but we'll show that even accepting these dates, the claims do not hold water. Above this timeline, then, we see um, several claimed transitional forms called hominins. Uh, in the fossil record um, that in, in the claims of the scientific literature and textbooks. So we, for example, and, and the H in this chart stands for homo, so we are homo sapiens, modern man. And the claim is that if you go further back in time, you will encounter fossils that show the existence of increasingly ape-like creatures and the uh, earliest um, claimed hominid in the homo genus is Homo rudolfensis, that dates to about two and a half million years on the timeline. And then going below the, the timeline here in your chart, you'll see um, genuses that are, are genera that are not homo. Uh, we have, for example, uh, the Australopithecine genus, and that would include, um, you might have heard the nickname the Tong, the tong Child, that's uh, Australopithecus africanus, 
Lucy is Australopithecus afarensis, and in 2009, the world learned of Artipithecus ramidus, who is nicknamed Artie. So we'll go through uh, these, the most important claims, and show why they are, why they are not um, legitimate. So I'm going to simplify the chart here as we start off looking at some of the important claims in the genus of Homo, which is our own genus. All right, so let's start talking about Homo erectus. He is claimed to be the immediate uh, predecessor of modern man, Homo sapiens, and he's shown in the textbooks to have existed from about 1.8 million or maybe even 2 million years ago up to about 300,000 or even a little more recent. Well, let's learn a little bit about his history. So the history of Homo erectus begins in 1891 with a discovery made by Eugene Dubois on the island of Java. He found a tooth, a primitive-looking skull cap, and a modern-looking left femur or, or thigh bone. You can see pictures of them there. So he put these together and called this Pithecanthropus erectus, meaning erect ape. So it's a primitive looking skull cap, but a modern looking postcranial pattern. So he thought it was an erect ape, uh, hence the name. This was later changed to Homo erectus. Du Dubois' work is still regarded uh, with, uh, with reverence in the scientific community in, by evolutionists. In 1997, National Geographic says that um, his, his find was one of the greatest success stories in the history of science. All right, so these, that's a typical claim you'll hear, but then once you start dig digging into the details, the stories always fall apart. After the initial find by Dubois, subsequent Homo erectus fossils were found in Africa, Asia, Australia, and Europe. The cranial capacity averages just over 1,000 cubic centimeters. That's just a measure of the, the volume inside the, the cranial, uh, cranium versus about 1350 cc's cubic centimeters for Homo sapiens. And it is claimed in the textbooks that he had a more primitive morphology, but this is often exaggerated in artist renderings. All right, so who is Homo erectus really? I'm going to start quoting from the scientific journals where they are a bit more forthright about who Homo erectus really resembles than they are in the science textbooks uh, in biology classes. So we see from the Journal of Human Evolution the explanation that by 1.5 million years ago, hominins, this is when Homo erectus lived, hominins had evolved in an essentially modern human foot function and bipedal locomotion. Endurance running may have been possible from a thermal regulatory viewpoint for Homo erectus. Changes in locomotor anatomy, so in the, the legs and feet, from Homo erectus to modern man were relatively minor, and by the earliest Homo erectus times, body size was essentially modern. All Homo erectus fossil clavicles, this is in the shoulder, uh, fall within the normal range of modern human variation. These data support reconstructing the Homo erectus shoulder as modern human-like and suggest that the capacity for high-speed throwing dates back nearly 2 million years. There are no essential differences between Homo erectus and comparator fossil specimens for the genus Homo after 1.3 million years ago. We argue that the modern hand morphology is present in the genus Homo subsequent to Homo habilis. So this, this is about 1.8 million years ago. So many descriptions here suggest that his function, his look, would have been exactly like ours. Science in uh, 2003 issued a report on a cranium base. That, that's very rare to find a cranium base intact. But it led to the conclusion that Homo erectus was unexpectedly modern in, ina un in anatomy, not hunched over um, like is so often shown in, in the biology textbooks. There was a famous uh, Homo erectus find in Africa near Neri Katomi boy, um, and analysis have shown that he would have grown between 5 feet 9 and 5 feet 11 in height and weight, and, and weighed between 176 and 183 pounds had he lived to maturity. Again, very descriptive of, of modern humans. Now, I mentioned earlier that the average cranial capacity is a little over 1,000 cubic centimeters. 
but this is well within the range for Homo sapiens, which is usually sighted between seven and 800 uh, cubic centimeters on the low end, up to about 2,200 centimeter, cubic centimeters on the, on the high end. So although uh, Homo erectus has an average below the 1,350 cubic centimeters uh, average for Homo sapiens, the question is, does this really matter, and would it justify classification as a separate species? We'll return to this question, this important question, a little bit later. All right, uh, when, we, when the paleoanthropologists use the term sinking, they mean it should be eliminated as a legitimate classification. If you go into the scientific literature, there's much argument that Homo erectus should be sunk because it's not a legitimate uh, classification as an independent species separate from Homo sapiens. So let's just look through some of the, the statements in the scientific literature. Well, one piece of evidence supports the realization or, or is based on the, the finding that Homo sapiens and Homo erectus fossils occur at the same location for extended period of times. Fossils displaying features of both Homo erectus and Homo sapiens are common. And the scientific literature admits that non-evolutionary factors are sufficient to explain the erectus versus sapiens variation, which is why even notable evolutionists have called for the elimination or sinking of Homo erectus into Homo sapiens. So you would take all the fossils that are now classified as Homo erectus and acknowledge really there's no reason to consider those as separate species. Those really are Homo sapiens. All right, let's go into some more information here. This is a statement by Milford Wolpuff at the University of Michigan. He's the author of the leading college textbook on paleoanthropology, so a very respected source. He wrote that we, regards, we regard the species distinction between Erectus and Homo sapiens as being problematic due to the difficulty in clearly distinguishing an actual boundary between the two. We should either admit that the erectus sapiens boundary is arbitrary or Homo erectus should be sunk. Sinking Homo erectus would carry the advantages of explicitly recognizing the arbitrariness of the boundary. More importantly, it would eliminate the necessity of relying on dates to determine which species and number of specimens belong to. And uh, the previous talk very brief briefly talked about some of the problems on dating and yet the evolutionists very often will classify fossil finds based upon the date, dating results on uh, specific fossils that they uncovered. All right, it's also important to acknowledge that for more than 45 years, the scientific literature has admitted that differences in morphology between modern man and Homo erectus fossils can be explained by non-evolutionary factors. In 1972, as a result of some finds in Australia at a place called Cow Swamp, uh, an article in Nature said that the, the resemblances uh, can be, or the differences in shape can be explained by inbred communities of the Homo erectus fossils, nutritional problems, low-grade anemia, genetic factors, endocrinal factors, a pathological condition, natural variation in bone thickness that provides a better chance of being preserved. Uh, erectus fossils tend to be thick, leading to the false conclusion that the whole population was thick-boned and of a different species. So we don't have to go to a, an evolutionary explanation according to the scientific, scientific literature to explain differences in the fossils that, that are found, some that are classified as Homo erectus. All right, there are also many other problems with Homo erectus. One of them concerns the dating results of the fossil finds. Homo erectus dates to as recently as 10,000 years ago, and as of 2017, Homo sapiens, due to a find in Morocco, now dates to as long ago as 300,000 years ago, according to the scientific literature. The Java man skull, remember, it included a skull cap and a femur that were found about, uh, as it turns out, found about 50 feet apart among hundreds of skeletons. And so Dubois had the option to go around this huge bone pile deposit, find a primitive looking skull that, that washed up, this was along the Solo River in Java, 
and combine that with a modern looking femur and claim, voila, I found a transitional form. So there, there's much uh, detail about the Java man skull that, that, um, that just makes the whole claim fall apart. Um, the femur, remember, was evaluated and described as being indistinguishable from modern man or homo sapiens. So this is raises a very difficult question for evolutionists. The question is, how can Homo erectus evolve into Homo sapiens some 300,000 years ago or even more recent? If Homo sapiens lived alongside of Homo erectus at the Java Man site 1.5 million years ago, that's what we call a contemporary status issue. Homo sapiens was on the scene, apparently, whenever Java Man lived. So how can you say it took, it took till 300,000 or even more recent uh, years ago for Homo sapiens to, uh, to emerge. So this, this again is the cont contemporary status problem with Homo sapiens. The best solution and the one consistent with the fossil evidence is to sink, get rid of Homo erectus. He is substantially similar to Homo sapiens in most aspects, and the largest difference, as we mentioned, is on cranial capacity that we still need to address. Once we get rid of Homo erectus, a lot of other sinkings occur. Homo ergaster on your chart, that's the name given to Homo erectus fossils in East Africa. Many evolutionists do not even accept the classification. Homo ancestor is described as having, having a totally modern face. He dates more recent than Homo erectus, uh, is found mostly in Europe. Homo heidelbergensis, another European find, is also called archaic Homo sapiens. It has a morphology and cranial capacity very near Homo sapiens, even more modern than Homo erectus. He obviously can be sunk as well. Neanderthal man, as it was said in the previous uh, lecture, uh, had a very large cranial capacity, larger on average than Homo sapiens. And recent DNA studies show that Neanderthal, Neanderthal man was at least 99.7% genetically similar. There have been a number of fossils that display both Homo sapiens and uh, Neanderthal man characteristics, so obviously ne Neanderthal man should be sunk as a separate classification, which the scientific literature, almost all evolutionists have, have done that in, in, uh, in their research. All right, so um, that's a very brief <laughs> explanation of why we should get rid of at least half of the Homo claim transitional forms on your chart. Now let's go a little bit further back and talk about a very interesting find by Louis Leakey uh, and his wife Mary in the uh, 19, early 1960s called Homo habilis. Homo habilis is the most often uh, seen illustration in the high school biology textbook. So let's see why he falls apart. Found, it was uh, found, the bones were found in Oldovi, uh, George, Tanzania in 1960 by Louis and Mary Leakey. They were dated to approximately two, two million years ago, so just beyond Homo erectus at the time. He, uh, the fossils were described by Louis Leakey in uh, Nature as a distinct type of early hominid. But when you look deeper, he completely falls apart according to the scientific literature. Um, as it turned out, when, when Leakey first published his, uh, his findings, in the scientific literature, immediate criticism erupted about the Homo habilis fossils and the establishment of a claimed new species. And here's why. It appears very likely that Homo habilis was simply a mixture of Australopithecine, which is an ape-like creature, and Homo erectus, which is human, fossils. In 1965, a very critical article uh, published in Nature said, it is by no means clear that the bed one and bed two groups, these are the strata the fossils were found in, the bed one and bed two groups of specimens necessarily belong to the same species. It would seem that there is more reason for associating the bed one group of specimens with Australopithecus and the bed two group with Homo erectus. The smaller brained, uh, okay, so, so the claim was leaky mixed together and formed what is called an invalid taxon. A new species name should never have been uh, created. That basic conclusion has been consistently expressed in the scientific literature ever since. In 2003, an, an article in Science Magazine stated that the smaller-brained, small-tooth hominids that have been placed in Homo habilis may be thought of as a form of Australopithecine. In 1999, another article in Science stated that 
Homo habilis should be sunk as a classification due to its small brain size, only 552 cubic centimeters. Um, its resemblance to the Australopithecines, its estimated body mass of 34 kilograms, which was well below that of Homo erectus at 57 kilograms, the hand bones and long arms suggesting that Homo habilis was capable of proficient climbing. So this is a, when you separate out the Homo habilis fossils, some are very modern, belong to Homo sapiens, others are very primitive and are simply uh, extinct, extinct primate uh, uh, specimens. All right, that takes us back in your drawing. The, the, uh, the earliest Homo claimed hominid is Homo rudolfensis. Um, what we find, though, looking into the details, I mean, he, he looks pretty modern, doesn't he, as far as the, the high cranial vault there. Uh, he doesn't have a very protruding um, front uh, lower jaw like the Australopithecan and, and ape, ape fossils do. And it turns out that he is uh, similar in size to Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. 1470, which is the most fam famous uh, find uh, that you see pictured here, by it was found by uh, Richard Leakey, son, son of Lewis. And that fossil was described in Science News in 1972 when it was first uh, being reported. It was described as remarkably rem reminiscent of modern man. As we said, it has a very flat face. Other fossils, uh, leg fossil bones, uh, uh, designated as 1481 and 1472, these were described as having features that are widely considered characteristic of modern Homo sapiens. So see, the comparison in the scientific literature, it's not to Homo habilis, it's not to Homo erectus, it's, it's saying that these are Homo sapiens-like, very, very modern in, uh, in morphology or bone shape. Okay, so if we revise the timeline based upon information we've discussed already from the scientific literature, we see that three of the very key and most important claimed transitional forms in our genus are really reassigned. Uh, Habilis gets divided between Homo sapiens fossils and Australopithecine fossils. Rudolfensis and Homo erectus are assigned to Homo sapiens. So you start having something in the Homo genus that looks very much like special creation. All right, so you look at that chart and you say, well, John, surely no evolutionist and surely the scientific literature is not going to agree with that drastic reassignment. And actually, they do, or, or at least some of them are coming around. And it's based upon an extremely interesting uh, series of finds in uh, the country, Eastern European country of Georgia that occurred between 2000 and 2013. Uh, that the finds consisted of a total of five uh, skulls that varied dramatically in terms of morphology, cranial capacity, and so forth. And depending upon the skull that you look at, it could be compared to Homo erectus, Homo habilis, if you accept that classification, and Homo rudolfensis. Well, these skulls were all found at the same location. They all dated to 1.85 million years ago. So you can see where the 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 study team must have been scratching their head for some time, and they were, trying to decide how to classify these fossils. Finally, when they made their publication, it created, uh, it was described as creating a small bomb in the field of paleoanthropology. Here are the conclusions of the Georgia team. They said that there is growing evidence that variation in fossil hominids tends to be misinterpreted as species diversity, especially when single fossil specimens from different localities are compared. Morphological diversity in the African fossil Homo record around 1.8 million years ago, and that, and that is the date where Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and Homo ergaster are all claimed to have lived side by side, but that diversity in the African fossil record around 1.8 million years ago probably reflects variation between a single living lineage. And they assigned that single uh, lineage the name Homo erectus, but as we discussed, there are reasons to eliminate Homo erectus and to sink those fossils into Homo sapiens. Most probably, they concluded that Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis belong to a single evolving Homo lineage, just as we concluded in our timeline a few slides ago. All right, so you may think, well, if, that, if evolutionists can go that far, how can they still call themselves evolutionists? Because there's only one species in the Homo uh, genus, 
according to our diagram here. And the answer is that they still have faith that there are uh, intermediate forms leading from ape-like creatures to the homo genus uh, that date back to between five and seven million years ago. We will briefly take a look at uh, some of the most uh, famous uh, claims in this in this category that includes Afri Africanus or the Tong child is the nickname Afarensis or Lucy and then Artipithecus rhamnus which is nicknamed Artie. All right, so let's start off here with Africanus. Some background: Africanus was found in 1924 and uh, uh, given to an anatomist named Ray Raymond Dart. Uh, it was it was a juvenile, very small cranial uh, size. So it was uh, from a, a, a child, and so they nicknamed it the Tong child. The uh, genus designation was uh, Australopithecus. That was created by Dart, and this uh, this means southern ape. Uh, it is now known as Australopithecus africanus, and it has a very small cranial capacity of only about 440 cubic centimeters. Again, the average for, for Homo sapiens is 1350. Evolutionists say it may have, may have given rise to Homo about two million years ago, or slightly, slightly more. Okay, but based on the information we've already discussed, we can see why this sequence is very problematic. For one reason, the modern-looking Rudolfensis appears at 2.4 million years ago, while Africanus is said to have transitioned to early Homo around 2 million years ago. The cranial capacity of 440 cubic centimeters compares to 775 cubic centimeters for 1470. That dates, again, at between 2.3 and 2.4 million years ago. Africanus has a, an extremely ape-like skull morphology. He also had a divergent grasping toe, toe like, uh, like, many apes, like the apes do. But yet... Modern-looking Rudolfensis was described in, in the below below the uh, cranium as very modern-like in terms of the the uh, the uh, fibulas and, and uh, other fossil bones that were found. So it gets very problematic to ever accept the claim that this creature that lived about two million years ago evolved into this creature uh, that lived at two point four million years ago. The morphology. And the size is exactly opposite of what it should be if that sequence was true. Africanus also has other problems in that Africanus was said to have evolved from Lucy, which is Afarensis. And yet what we find in the literature is that Africanus is actually more ape-like than Lucy, its supposed predecessor. So from the scientific literature, we see reports in science concluding that the body proportions of Africanus were actually more ape-like and perhaps more suited to life in trees than those of Afarensis, its presumed ancestor. So we have problems going from Africanus to Homo rudolfensis. We also have problems uh, when we talk about uh, Africanus's uh, predecessor, uh, Lucy. The Journal of Human Evolution stated that Africanus was extremely ape-like in its morphology and possibly arboreally adapted. No single feature can be used to separate this tibia unequivocally from that of a chimpanzee. It's difficult to reconcile with the interpretation that Afarensis was ancestral to Africanus. So now, this claim sequence that we see in the textbooks and that's on your handout, the, the, the uncertainties go deep <laughs> go deep into the Australopithecian uh, Australopithecine claims. Okay, so now let's let's look at Lucy. She's probably the most uh, famous uh, fossil find probably ever. She may be eclipsed in the end by Artie, who we'll also talk about. All right, so when we talk about Afarensis or, or Lucy, uh, the fossils were discovered in the Hadar region of Ethiopia in 1974 by Donald Johansson. They consisted of about 20% of a complete skeleton. The Johansson team claimed that Lucy was the mother of us all and that the species was a habitual biped. In other words, it was an upright walker and didn't go on all fours or on, on its palms. The find seemed to confirm that the Australopithecines were on the evolutionary path to Homo, and this allowed Johnson to become a rock star almost instantly and gain more influence than even the Leakey family, which did not accept 
that the Australopithecines as part, were part of man's evolutionary past. And you'll find that in, in the scientific literature that there are all kinds of competing theories because there can only be one uh, legitimate sequence leading to modern man. So there's all kinds of, of competition and backstabbing between the evolutionists. Um, and a lot of it has occurred between Johansson's team, that now includes uh, Tim White. He's, he's done a lot of work with Tim White, who we'll talk about shortly, and uh, against the Leakies. All right, so when you see this is this is a, an exhibit from a, uh, a uh, museum, you think, well, looking at that, there surely must be enormous evidence to support the claim that Lucy was a habitual biped and an upright walker. But actually, the... Uh, the evidence, the, the biggest piece of evidence that was used to make that argument were a set of footprints, the Laetoli footprints, which were found in an entirely different location more than 1,000 miles away in Tanzania. And so let's take a look at these footprints for a minute and see if they really fit into the claim that they were made by Lucy. All right, so there you see some, some uh, prints of the Laetoli foot, uh, some molds of the Laetoli footprints. And those uh, date to 1979 when Mary Leakey reported on footprint trails left in volcanic ash at the Laetoli site in Tanzania, as I said, a thousand miles from the Hadar site where, um, where Lucy was found. The footprints were dated to 3.6 million years by uh, various techniques. And the Laetoli footprints were attributed to Lucy, even though the prints reveal a foot that was described by Mary Leakey as exactly like ours, like Homo sapiens. Well, this immediately created controversy when Donald Johansson's team tried to claim the footprints for Lucy. Mary Leakey went out and hired a foot specialist to perform multiple studies of the footprints and compare those to the Australopithecines. Here's what Russell Tuttle uh, explained. He said, in discernible features, the Laetoli G prints are indistinguishable from those of habitually barefoot Homo sapiens. The trails were portrayed as remarkably human, yet they were presumed to have been created by afarensis. But these beasts had ape-like features, notably down-curved toes, that I just didn't detect in the prints. The proportions of the Laetoli prints are well within the range found among the Peru Indians studied as part of his, his investigation. So who won the debate? Well, Lucy did because no evolutionist would allow for the possibility that Homo and even Homo sapiens lived more than three million years ago. It just doesn't fit the narrative that they've put forward. But subsequent finds have allowed a much more thorough analysis of afarensis. And so even though Lucy continues to be displayed in museums and biology textbooks as an upright walker, this is completely inaccurate and dishonest based on the information contained in the scientific literature. Let me just uh, very quickly go through some of the, the conclusions from the scientific literature about who Lucy really was. The scientific, uh, scientific literature tells us that she had long and curved toes, a gait that is not identical to modern Homo sapiens. A knee, the knee of afarensis is completely compatible with a significant degree of arboreal uh, or tree locomotion. The animal slept, ate, and lived primarily in the trees. Lucy's wrist exhibits characteristics seen today only in the African apes. These features are thought to be associated with knuckle walking. The inner ear chambers, which house organs that help us maintain our balance while standing or moving, meant that afarensis still tended to clamber in the trees rather than amble across the savanna. My goodness, how deceptive these museum displays are that indoctrinate millions of kids and adults. Uh, every year. The scapular morphology displays several trait characteristics of suspensory apes. Their locomotor repertoire included a substantial amount of climbing. It gets even more outrageous. In 1976, two years after the finds at Hadar, Johansson announced that among the bones recovered were much larger bones that belonged to Homo. So in, in the initial publications, he said, I found these Australopithecine bones. I've also found bones that, uh, uh, that date to the same time period that he classified as Homo. So again, he, we see a coexistence here of Homo and the Australopithecines. He stated in nature that Homo and Australopithecus coexisted as early as three million years ago. 
But a short time later, he after he met uh, a, a man named Tim White, Tim White is the leading paleoanthropologist in the world today. I trust White's evaluations of all fossils except his own <laughs> because he's trying to put, you know, ar argue that his finds are the, the real uh, missing link and, and the bridgeway to modern man. But once Johansson met Tim White, a short time later, he, uh, Johansson decided to argue that the Australopithecines were ancestor ancestral to Homo. How did he address this contemporary status issue when he had already announced that Homo lived alongside Lucy? Well, the team claimed that the larger Homo fossils were males of the species and the smaller fossils were females. This is called sexual dimorphism that does occur in some uh, a, a species. But the question is, is this a plausible explanation? The answer is no, because the difference between the bones was not only size, but shape. The bones assigned to the Australopithecine females were clearly suited for climbing in trees, while the bones assigned to the males of the species were structured for upright walking. This was an outrageous suggestion, but the press never looked into the details and the evolution, evolutionary style to it never pressed the issue because Lucy brought unprecedented fanfare to paleoanthropology. Even so, additional studies published in the scientific literature del delicately stated, we wish to draw the reader's attention to the possibility that the large and small individuals at Hadar may not have identical locomotor profiles. They may represent different taxa, the larger of which is more human-like in posture and gait. So th just... Um, grouping all those fossils together did not get rid of the real issue here. In a very detailed 40-page analysis of the Lucy fossils uh, published in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology, Sussman and Stern concluded that uh, the femur, uh, labeled as AL333.3, uh, fossil number, uh, was not only large, but it is remarkably modern in most aspects of its morphology. The fossil is uh, is, uh, is remarkably human, has a human um, like, and gives it is human like, and gives no indication that the represented individuals were significantly different from modern humans in either frequency or manner of terrestrial biped bipedality. Uh, the, they further said that the Hadar material consists of several distinct species which were previously jumbled together. This is in the Journal of Human Evolution. So what exactly does the evidence really suggest about Lucy? It suggests that she was an ape-like primate that went extinct. She never involved to man because man lived alongside of Afarensis. More generally now, when we talk about the whole Australopithecus genera, um, a, lead of, a leading evolutionist of the 70s and 80s uh, reached these final these conclusions. He wrote that most of the Australopithecine fossil fragments are in fact uniquely different from both man and man's nervous living genetic relatives, the chimpanzee and gorilla. To the extent that resemblances exist with living forms, they tend to be with the orangutan. The Australopithecines are not structurally closely similar, similar to humans. The Australopithecines are now irrevocably removed from a place in the evolution of human bipedalism and certainly from any place in the direct human lineage. So the leading expert on the quantitative study of skeletons says the Australopithecines have nothing to do with human evolution. That's from his book, The Order of Man. Other problems, as we mentioned, arise because fossil, uh, fossils dating older than the Australopithecines have been described as having a modern morphology. Here's just a, a, a brief um, example. In 1965, there was a fossil discovery that was a, a preserved distal end of a left humerus, and it was dated to 4.4 million years ago. The fossil name is KP271. It should arguably be, be one of the most uh, well-known fossils ever discovered. In Science Magazine, it was said that in these diagnostic measurements, KP271 is strikingly close to the means of the human sample, the humeral fragment with a date of about 4.4 million years cannot be distinguished from Homo sapiens morphologically. We suggest that it might represent Australopithecus because at the time, the allocation to Homo seemed preposterous, 
although it would be the correct one without the time element. So we talked earlier about how very often fossils are assigned not based on their shape and morphology, but on how old they are dated. That, that's what happened with KP-271. Also in 2015, another example of very old uh, homo-like fossils. The oldest fossil um, uh, was a mandible or jawbone with teeth. Generally accepted uh, by the evolutionary establishment was discovered and classified as homo, and it dates 2.8 million years ago. In 2017, this is very interesting, human-like footprints were reported. This was on an island, or this was found on Crete, and they dated to 5.7 million years ago. So here, <laughs> if, if that holds, that these, these are ever classified as human-like and homo sapiens-like, it would destroy every claim hominid that, that has ever been put forward. That's why the scientific literature make, made conclusions such as the following. Uh, it was said that interpretations of these footprints is controversial because Crete is some distance from all other sites where hominids of a similar age have been found. If the animal that made the prints was not a hominid, it must have been a previously unknown non-human primate that evolved into a human-like foot independently. So evolutionists simply cannot follow the evidence that is very obvious that this is a human footprint. They can't follow that because it doesn't fit their narrative and the overall Cartesian-Darwinian narrative. All right, so we've talked through everybody now except uh, that, that we will today accept the last figure there, which is Artipithecus ramidus, nicknamed Artie for short. Artie was announced in 2009. Science Magazine devoted an entire issue, I think 11 or 13 articles, to the announcement. Uh, this announcement, or the, the discovery team, was led by Tim White, who I, dis uh, who I mentioned earlier. But when you look at the, the details, you see that there really is very little reason to conclude that Artie was anything but a ape -like, an ape-like creature. In the scientific literature, the teeth were described as far closer to that of a chimpanzee than to any known hominid centered in the chimpanzee ranges for these measures. The cranial fossils are strikingly chimpanzee-like in morphology. Some evolutionists dis dismiss these hominids as fossils, uh, as leg legitimate hominid fossils, writing that the published fossils are so chimp-like that they may represent the long-lost ancestor of the chimp, not the human lineage. So who was Artie, really? He was an ape-like creature that had nothing to do with human ancestry. I go into quite a bit more detail in uh, the book, um, chapter uh, 13, about Artie. But one thing um, I want to emphasize here is that in addition to being unconvincing as far as the fossil uh, morphology and fitting that into a human, se human evolutionary sequence, he also revealed the fallacy of a 40-plus year evolutionary claim. And this has to do not with fossils, but with the concept that's called the molecular clock. And what has been claimed for more, almost 50 years now is that genetic studies, if we compare the genetics of, say, a chimpanzee and a human, and we figure out, based on an assumed mutation rate, and we go back in time and identify when the genetics between the two species was the same. So we, we've got the current uh, genome here of, say, Homo sapiens, current genome of the chimpanzee. If we assume an average mutation rate for each and go back in time, we will arrive at a point in the, in the past at which they shared a common ancestor. In other words, their, their genomes were the same. And for 40 plus years, it's been claimed that doing this molecular clock process gives us a result of between five and seven million years, which just happens to coincide with the paleoanthropologist claim of when the fossil evidence suggests that a common ancestor with a chimpanzee existed. Okay, well, already put a hole in this whole charade that the genetic evidence is similar to or, or confirms the fossil evidence and provides an independent scientific ev evidence. What the Artie team, Artie team proposed is that the common ancestor didn't really live five to seven million years ago, as has long been claimed, but actually it was between seven and ten million years ago that, that the common ancestor with, with humans actually lived. So 
just so they're claiming maybe up to a hundred percent increase in the date of this common ancestor from five to ten million years ago, but then they also made uh, made the statement that the molecular clock is based upon broad assumptions about both the regular uh, regularity of molecular change, in other words, the the mutation rate, and the reliability of calibration dates required to establish such rates have strong limitations. So the only way that they could make a claim for Artie as, as the common ancestor living 7 to 10 million year, years ago is to say, well, we can't trust the previous 100 years of fossil evidence, and we also can't trust the genetic studies uh, through molecular clock, the molecular clock process because that gives the same answer as the fossils of 5 to 7 million years ago. So they basically discredit everything that had ever come before and said, already proves that our, our understanding of human evolution for the past hundred years has been mistaken. Okay, just to finish up with a couple things here, this is the, the icon of evolution that you see in all the textbooks. But if you look at the actual data from the scientific literature related to uh, the weight and also the cranial capacity of these so-called hominids, you see something very different than what is commonly portrayed. If you look at the body mass, for example, you see enormous variation going from high to low to high to low to high to low to high. That is not an evolutionary sequence, is it? It, it differs drastically from what is portrayed in the traditional uh, drawings, the icons. If we look at cranial capacity, we see a similar type pattern, especially in the homo genus. It's just it's like a roller coaster going up and down, up and down. Again, that is not an evolutionary sequence. Um, that that is believable. You might look back here and say, well, at least for a couple of these, we have we have uh, you know a, a, an evolutionary type trend going from smaller to slightly larger over time, and that involves Africanus and Afarensis. But remember, Africanus is described in the scientific literature as much more primitive in morphology. It it definitely has a divergent toe. Whereas, remember, Afarensis was claimed to have made the Laetoli footprints and not have a divergent toe. So even that little stretch there that looks like it might fit into an evolutionary story falls apart. All right, so um, I'm going to uh, very briefly cover, you may have heard of uh, recent finds, uh, one in South Africa uh, called Homo naledi. This was, um, this came to light, I think about four years ago, and there's another find in Indonesia, uh, island find called Homo uh, Flor Florizensis. Uh, they call him the Hobbit uh, by nickname because both of these were very small individuals, um, but yet they had relatively modern uh, morphology or bone shape. Uh, bone shape. The Leti dates about 200,000 years ago. The Hobbit, less than 50,000 years ago. Well, Homo, Homo sapiens is dated by all, ev ev all evolutionists now to 300,000 years ago and to 2 million years ago by some, such as Wolpolf of University of Michigan. So how can these two small creatures be evolutionary predecessors leading to modern man when they existed, they lived so recently? They really cannot. Well, let's dig into this uh, in a little more detail. From a recent book put out by a Dr. John Sanford, who was part of the DVD series, he's a geneticist, uh, formerly of Cornell University. He has a book that he put out with Christopher uh, Roop a couple years ago, and it's devoted to evaluating the fossil evidence. But when they're answering this question, they conclude about, um, about these two specimens. They say that a strong case can be made that they suffered from inbreeding. We talked about that previously with Homo erectus, which led to their morphological oddities and eventual extinction. All hunter-gathering people live in small tribes. If such tribes do not interbreed with other tribes, over time they must always undergo genetic inbreeding, causing bad mutations to arise. It is increasingly realized that many generations of inbreeding and long-term starvation produces human populations that will display various genetic pathologies dramatically reduce body size, and very dramatically reduce brain size. Naledi appears to be an example of this. The small cranial capacity of Naledi is not a valid reason to assign it to a new species or deny it human status. 
well, you think, okay, well, that there's probably some good argument there, but again, would the scientific literature ever agree with that? And the answer is yes. When uh, the Hobbit was first announced in Nature, the the uh, the lead author of the article stated that tropical rainforests um, offer a very limited supply of calories for hominids. Selection should favor the reduced energy requirements of smaller individuals. Dwarfing may have been the end product of selection for small body size in a lower calorific environment. We anticipate further discoveries of highly endemic hominid species in locations similarly affected by long-term genetic isolation. So they made a prediction, and a few years later, Naledi uh, was, was discovered in South Africa. So very likely, we don't need to look even at these two small individuals in an evolutionary light. In fact, the dates don't, don't fit with evolu an evolutionary story. But it's very likely inbreeding and limited calorific intake that accounts for their small size. All right, so we've gone very brief, briefly through many of the most uh, well-known finds, and I think it's easy for this audience to accept that evolution isn't supported by the fossil evidence. What you increasingly find, though, even in the scientific literature, is, is a doubt about human evolution. In Science Magazine, an article appeared that explained, into the trash, in fact, may go the very definition of what it means to be a hominid as there is now little agreement on what key traits identify an exclusively human ancestor. Nor is there agreement on which species led to Homo, or even whether the fossils represent different species or variation within a single species. So the more fossils that are found, the more confusion arises, and even uh, the faithful doubt that the evidence supports human evolution, at least the traditional story. A very important uh, study appearing in the National Academy of Sciences by two leading evolutionists, uh, Bernard Wood and Mark Collard, uh, concluded the following when they compared results from molecular clock studies with the fossil evidence. This was just fascinating. They, they concluded that we found that evolutionary histories based on the fossil data were incompatible with evolutionary histories based on molecular clock studies. Little confidence can be placed in evolutionary histories generated solely from, from higher primate fossil evidence. The corollary is that the existing evolutionary hypotheses about human evolution are unlikely to be reliable. Accordingly, new approaches are, are required. So they're saying, I mean, these evolutionists, these two that authored this article, they're among the most well-known paleoanthropologists in the world. And they're saying you can't trust the fossil evidence. So when we look at the real information in the scientific literature, um, I, like, I like recalling a quote of Thomas Huxley. He said that every hypothesis is bound to explain, or at any rate not be inconsistent with, the whole of facts which it professes to account for. And if there is a single one of these facts which can be shown to be inconsistent with the hypothesis, the hypothesis falls to the ground, it is worth nothing. And that's why we've titled the name of the, the recent book, The Fall of Darwin's Last Icon. All the other icons, you know, peppered moths, uh, finches, and so forth, whale evolution, all, the whole list have, have strongly been discredited. What, is re, what remains to fall or to be recognized as having fallen is the, the icon of evolution. But if we apply anything close to the requirements of Huxley, we see that the hypothesis of human evolution falls to the ground. It is worth nothing. In the book Beyond the Ivory Tower, Sir Sally Zuckerman wrote, and this was back in the early 70s, he observed at that time, and it's only gotten worse, he said that students of fossil primates have not been distinguished for caution. The record is so astonishing that it is legitimate to ask whether much science is to be found in the field at all. And of course, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, questions such as, where did we come from? What is my origin? Those are decisive for the meaning of our life and for our actions, according to the Catholic Church. And that's why it's a tragedy when we see leading evolutionists such as Kenneth Miller write in, Finding Darwin's God, that it is time to place Genesis 
along the geocentric myth in the basket of stories that once, in a world of intellectual naivete, made helpful sense. And as long as that lie of human evolution is out there, this culture will resemble, will resemble uh, the description of Hosea when it says, my people perish for want of knowledge. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's about lunchtime. <laughs>